Um, the, the topic is teaching heterogeneous classes or, as it says up there, teaching large mixed level classes. I put in also the aspect of large because if classes are very mixed, the problems are made even more difficult if they are also large. And a lot of classes in India are, are what I would call large classes. Um, um, what is a large class? What is a large class in Indian terms? More than? 80, 100, 200. Um, a small class would be 40, 30, 25? Yes, OK. Um, I, was, I went to give this talk in, in Russia, and I asked them what was a large class. And they said 20 is a large class. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a, it's a totally different thing. Um, where I come from, the average is 25, 30, so 40 would be a large class. In India, 40 would not be a large class. It would be an average class, right? Um, so it depends where you're coming from, really. And the numbers don't really mean very much. I prefer to define a large class by a class where there are so many learners um, that you feel you can't attend to individuals. You may not even know all their names in some cases. Um, you cannot activate or hear contributions from all the class, so you have the feeling that you're going to neglect some of them. Um, and it's difficult or impossible to find time to check all their written work. So that's, that's really the best definition of a large class. And the question is, what is a heterogeneous class? Sometimes called mixed, mixed ability or mixed level. But mixed ability, mixed level only covers a very small part of what a heterogeneous class is. So let's look and see um, what you think um, a heterogeneous class. It's a class which is varied in. You call out things, I'll add them. We'll see what else you, you think about. So? No. I didn't mean to have caps lock. Cultural, I can't get it not to do caps for some reason. Different. Different L1 and different, and may have different disabilities. Yes, I put L1. Let's make that more clearer. Mother tongue. The H won't do. Mother tongue. Um, disabilities. Yes, what else? Expectations. Some of these keys aren't working. X. Yes? Age or maturity. You might even might get um, children who are the same age, but actually different maturity. Anything else? Uh, intelligence. Uh, intelligence is a very politically incorrect word to use, but I use it nevertheless. Cognitive ability, if you like, or intelligence is the different range of cognitive abilities of the different different students. Um, yes. Yes, I've yes I've got level here. Um, I would. Proficiency level, yes. Yes, very much so. Learning styles. Um, interests. Different levels of motivation. Different ability. I haven't got any more room, but I might add ability to discipline themselves. So more discipline. Attitudes, yes. 
motivation, I'll add that here, attitudes. Okay, so we've, what we have here is uh, that a heterogeneous class is a class, I'm sorry I've got a mistake there, but I'm not going to go back and correct it now, a class which is varied along all these different parameters. It's not just that they're different levels or just that they're different abilities. They're all sorts of different people. And um, in my presentation today, in, in the workshop, we're going to look at things which affect various aspects of that. Problems, various problems come when you're teaching large, heterogeneous classes. The main key one, I think, as teachers is how do I provide for learning for them? How do I make sure they're all learning? When they all have different learning styles or different levels, different abilities, how do I make sure that I am providing opportunities for each to progress at his own or her own level, learning style, and so on? How do I find suitable materials? A lot of materials are what I would call homogeneous. I'll be explaining what I mean later. They don't allow for um, responses at different levels. Um, discipline, because uh, some students may be more advanced, maybe getting bored, and so they're starting to talk to their neighbors instead of listening to you, and you get uh, discipline problems. Boredom, interest, Again, something which is too difficult is boring. Something which is too easy is boring. Something which is not suitable to my learning style or interests is boring. And I have a problem of how to keep my entire class interested in what I'm doing. Pace, what pace do I take it at? What level of difficulty? How do I reach all the individuals in a big class when they're all different? There's lots and lots of problems. Assessment, which I'm not going to deal with today because it's a whole different field on itself. You had a whole conference about that last year, so I think I'm allowed to leave that out this year. Um, it's not all bad news, actually. There are some advantages to classes like this. First of all, if you have a large class, then you're using your teaching personnel well. For each teacher, so many more students will get to learn English, so we have to say that. Um, Educational aspects, if uh, all sorts of different people are working together, um, then uh, you've got the uh, situation where you can encourage helping each other, tolerating, respecting, respecting the other uh, people who are different from me and learning to live with them. It's a sort of microcosm of society as a whole. Which are personal resources? If I have a discussion, and I want ideas or experiences. If I have a very mixed class, then the ideas coming out will be much richer than if I had a small homogeneous class. Incidentally, the best definition of a heterogeneous class I heard is a class of one. A homoge sorry, a homogeneous class is a class of one. A heterogeneous class is a class of two. Because as soon as you get more than one person, you're into a mixed class. So even a class of two is heterogeneous, let alone a class of 40, 50, or 100. Um, challenge teacher development. Um, if I'm teaching a, a class like this, then I'm stretched to the limit of my teaching ability. I have to be very inventive, creative, um, thoughtful about what kinds of procedures I'm using. And this will help me develop as a professional. And I'm not just saying this, there is actually research to show that teachers who are teaching these kinds of classes actually do develop more than teachers who are teaching easier, quote unquote, classes. So there is that as well. What I'm going to be looking at in this session for the next hour is, it's a little less than an hour already, um, some things that can help. I'm not going to call them solutions, I think that's a bit um, arrogant. Uh, but things that can help, simple techniques, um, things that can help and which do not demand um, too much investment of time or money. If I'm a busy teacher teaching 20, 30, 40 hours a week, I haven't got the time um, to create separate tasks for each child, which presumably would, would solve my problem, but I don't have the time. The, um, the time for that, I do not have the money to make tons and tons of photocopies and stuff. What I'm looking at in this session is ideas 
that for a minimum of investment, just a little tweak or a little twist, a little slightly different way of doing things can help us address the different students in a large class. So that's what I'm looking at. And I'm going to look at um, various principles divided into three sets. Firstly, I'm going to call keeping them motivated. I'm going to look at things like uh, variation in the way I teach my class and interest, the interest of the students. Um, the second heading is reaching the individual. Incidentally, this um, PowerPoint presentation will be on the British Council site. Um, and in any case, I'll be giving you my email. If you can't get it from that, you can write to me and I'll send it to you. Um, so if you'd like to take notes, that's fine, but you don't have to. Um, reaching the individual, individualization, which is slightly different from personalization. I'll be explaining the difference in a moment. Personalization and collaboration working together. Um, because um, if I can't teach all the students personally, they can help by teaching each other in some situations. And finally, the key one, and the last two items are perhaps the most important um, under the heading of providing for learning at different levels. The first is um, open ending, something I call open ending, which I'll explain when I get there. And the other is a principle called compulsory plus optional, or core plus optional. So I'll be going through these, um, showing you some ideas, trying some things out, um, and I hope that you'll find some useful things you can, you can take back to classrooms or teach um, the, the teachers that you are uh, teaching or supporting uh, wherever you come from. Um, there is room at the front here if you'd like to sit down. Um, okay, so we'll start off with the first, which is variation. Abraham Lincoln, there's a very good movie just come out about Abraham Lincoln, but I'm uh, the, the real Abraham, the historic Abraham Lincoln, um, once said, you can fool some of the people all of the time and all of the people some of the time, but you can't fool all of the people all of the time. You know that? So how that applies to us, and to be a little bit more serious, is we can, in a class of the kind I've just described, we can teach some of the students all of the time, and all of the students some of the time, but we cannot, being realistic, we cannot reach all of the students all of the time. Let's be realistic. We're human beings, they're human beings. There are going to be times when, in order to explain things to one set of students who haven't understood something, I'm going to neglect the students who already have understood and who are bored. Or, conversely, I might be giving something very challenging which answers the needs of some of my students and does not answer the needs of others. There are inevitably going to be times um, when some of my students I do not reach. And therefore, what I have to do is make sure that it's not always the same students. Not always the same students who are neglected, not always the same students who are taken care of. So I need to vary my lessons. Um, so I need to vary my topics so that a topic that is interesting to this set of students today, but not to them, I can use a different topic tomorrow so that the other set are interested. Similarly, demands, sometimes more easy, sometimes more difficult. Try not to get into the rut of doing things that are always the same sort of level addressing what a colleague of mine calls the non-existent average. Okay, so the ones in the middle who don't really exist. Um, classroom organization. This is a question of learning style. Okay, you mentioned learning style. Um, some people really like working on their own. Some people really like working collaboratively with their friends. Yet others prefer to sit quietly and just have the teacher uh, run the classroom. Um, there is no value in itself attached to collaborative work. It's not that group work is a good thing in itself. It happens to suit some students or some particular types of learning more than others. Um, if you're going to a conference, say you're going to a conference and someone's giving, there are two sessions on the teaching of vocabulary, and you know that one of them is a collaborative workshop where people will be working in pairs on tasks given by the lecturer, and the other is a straight top-down lecture. Which would you rather go to? Okay, I'm getting very mixed answers here. 
And, and it's not because one is better than the other. It's because people have different preferences. I, have, I, I would certainly go to the lecture, but my, a very good friend of mine would certainly go to the workshop. Um, it, it, because we have different learning styles, we learn in different ways. And it is perfectly legitimate to wish to, to prefer to learn in different ways. But what I need to be aware of is that, yes, my students, therefore, have different learning styles in this way. And that, therefore, I have to be, take care to use group work sometimes, but not too much, individual work sometimes, teacher-fronted work sometimes, so that I mix and cover my different students' learning styles. Visual all, again, to vary along visual all productive receptive um, parameters, and the different kinds of materials. Some students are really turned on by using electronic stuff, laptops, smartphones, whatever. Some students don't like and prefer pencil and paper. Some people prefer books. Some people prefer working off the board. There are all sorts of different preferences here. Again, I need to vary. So that's just the basic starting line, OK? Variation. The next one is interest. Of course, it's always important to be interesting, never mind who your classes are, even with the most the smallest, most homogeneous classes, it's always important to be interesting. It is particularly important in large heterogeneous classes because if you are doing an activity which is too difficult, too, sorry, too easy for a lot of the class, they are going to be bored unless you can make it worth their while to do it because it's interesting. And therefore, I have to design my activities with not only the difficulty level in mind, but also the interest value. What is interest? It's very, very difficult to define. Can you define it? What is interest? Something which keeps them working well. A threat of punishment could keep them working, but that wouldn't be interesting. Um, something they like doing, but something they enjoy doing, they may enjoy doing not because it's interesting. Right? Um, it, it's, very, it's a very slippery concept. But we all know what an interested class looks like. Okay? If they're interested, I know what they look like. They're, they're eager. They have this sort of expression of um, interest, curiosity, as well as enjoyment. Um, anyway, it's, it is essential. Uh, because, as I say, tasks may be too easy, too difficult, and therefore may be boring. So I've got to keep them interested, even if too easy for them, not according to their learning style, and so on and so on. Um, let's do an exercise here. Um, I'll put up that picture again in a moment. Um, I would like you, please, to get into groups of about three. I'm going to ask you to do some preliminary work first. Get into groups of three, get to know each other's names, and choose one person to be a secretary who has a fairly easy task, not too much to write, but needs a pencil and paper. So groups of three, names, secretary. And then I'll tell you what to do. It can be four. It can be four. It can be four or five even. You can be flexible. Or two. Three is just a baseline. So however you're comfortable. Okay. Is everyone ready? You know each other's names? You've got a secretary. You've got a pencil and paper. You could, I suppose, use a smartphone, but pencil and paper is simpler. Okay. Um, the task is this. I would like you to imagine that you're regressing to second year English. You're fairly small children, and your knowledge of English is limited to um, basic, basic nouns, prepositions, present tense, um, not, not very difficult uh, vocabulary. And this um, 
exercise is aimed at developing your speaking skills, just enabling to use the limited language you have to convey ideas, messages. I'm going to show the picture on the screen, which you saw for a moment uh, a couple of minutes ago. Um, and I will ask you members of the groups to say simple sentences about the picture. He is a man, okay? The sky is blue, whatever. It's using simple English. As many sentences as you can in exactly one minute. I'll say go when you start and stop when I want you to end. And the secretary, the secretary does not write down the sentences, but, <laughs> but for every sentence that anybody says, and the secretary, him or herself, may also say a sentence, for every sentence said, write a tick. Okay? So at the end of a minute, you should just have a row of ticks. All right? You may have five, ten, I don't know, however many you have. Okay? Are you ready? Yes. Okay? Go. You can... S <laughs> go. <laughs> Fast. have your ticks. How many do you have? Uh, we've 37 statements. How many? Oh. 37. Wow. <laughs> wow, wow, wow. Anybody else? 21? That's still a lot. Three. I don't believe it. This is an amazing... <laughs> I've never had a group of teachers who's got so many of it. Have you been practicing? <laughs> Okay. Okay. The second, the second round is like this. I'm going to show another picture in a moment. Um, you do it again. You try to break your record. Okay. Are you ready? Go. more, wasn't it? How many groups broke their previous record? Okay. Um, why, why were you interested? And don't tell me you weren't interested because I was watching. <laughs> The, the exercise was much too easy for you. 
<laughs> so I was, I was replicating the situation where you're, you're working on something which is much below your level and therefore potentially boring, but it wasn't boring. Competition. Why? Competition. Competition. Who was competing against who? The group of people. Did you feel that you were competing against other groups? No. 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 Mostly not. Some people do, but mostly people don't feel they're competing against other groups. Um, the second time, you're certainly competing against yourselves. Yes. The first time, but, but it had the feel of competition, didn't it? Uh, and, and the question is where this was coming from. I, th I think what it was coming from was there was a feeling of slight rise in adrenaline, yes. slight sort of um, slight positive stress, what you call positive stress. It was enjoyable. It wasn't stressful, nasty. It was, it was pleasant. It was the feeling you have when you're playing a game. It felt like a game. Curiosity. What was, what was game-like about it? What produced the game-like feeling? The timing. The timing. The timing. Because what, what was happening, you had, you had to do a very, very easy task. But you knew you only had one minute and the seconds were ticking away. Now, if I had said, say anything you like about the picture, Much less motivating, right? Um, the motivation is produced by the slight tension produced by the time limit. Um, and it's true of any game. What is a game? A game is something where you try to achieve some kind of goal, which is obviously easily achievable, but there is some constraint called rules which stop you doing it in the most obvious way. So tennis, for example, you have to hit the ball so that your opponent can't hit it back, right? But you have to get it over the net and you have to hit it within the white lines. Cricket. I won't start on cricket. Cricket is the most complicated game in the world. Um, but any, any game, chess, okay? You have to checkmate your, the king of the opponent, but you can only move your pieces in particular ways on the board, and so on and so on. Any game is characterized by an easy task made more challenging by the addition of some kind of limitation or rule. And in this case, it was the time limit. So uh, game-like features, uh, what also helps is higher order things, which doesn't actually apply in this particular activity, but I'll show you where it does. Um, entertainment, fun, um, visual materials, the fact that you have something to look at. And in this case, the pictures were very important, not that they were particularly marvelous pictures. Um, but the fact that you have something to look at is very important because if you don't have something to look at, the eyes are such a, a, a powerful channel that your eyes will find something else to look at and get distracted. Full participation, absolutely vital. Everybody was involved. Even if you weren't actually saying something, you were listening to your neighbors who were saying something, everyone was involved as opposed to the sort of usual teacher-student ping-pong, teacher asks one student answers, where only one student is activated at a time. In this kind of activity, all the students, or nearly all the students, are activated. So full participation is really important for interest. Open-ending, which I'll come on to later, there's no one right answer. You can say anything you like, well, within the limits of the task. Individualization is the next... Um, heading I want to look at. Individualization means adapting activities or exercises so that they accord with the different levels or speed of work of the individuals rather than personalization which applies to the whole person. And I'm just going to give a couple of interesting easy techniques here which um, can be applied even to the most standard 10 item grammar exercise. Um, and which allows for individual variation in speed and level, even with, within a set exercise. For example, um, instead of saying, here's a grammar exercise, who can do number one? Put your hands up. Who can do number two? Put your hands up. Who can do number three? Instead of that, uh, you say, I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to read through the questions. Raise your hands if you can answer any of the questions and start from that. You want to start from five, start from five. You want to start from 10, start from 10. And it gives them just that little bit of extra choice. It means that the slower students or the students who are less advanced can go straight for the easiest questions, even if it's not the first, 
They don't have to wait and compete with everyone else when they get there. And it allows for um, a higher level of individualization. The other principle, which is quite important, is giving a time limit rather than a quantity of work limit. So instead of saying, um, for homework, do exercise C on page 26, I say, for homework, um, do as much as you can of exercises C and D on page 26 in 20 minutes. You work for 20 minutes, and as much as you've done, you've done, and everybody works according to their own level. This, of course, implies that you can trust the students to do work according to your instructions. But a lot of students, in my, um, in my experience, can be trusted to do that. The same works for, is for classwork. OK, students, we've got 10 minutes. Do as much as you can of exercise C. And they do as much as they can. If they've done two questions, that's fine. If they've done five, that's fine. If they've done 10, that's fine. Because the limit I gave them, the, the success level I set, was I want to see all of you working for all of that time. And however much you've achieved, you've achieved. Everyone works according to their own speed, pace, level. So that's just a couple of um, tips there. Personalization means providing students with possibilities to express their own experience, preferences, opinions, ideas. And this doesn't only apply to more advanced classes. Here's a very simple um, one. Um, for elementary students, first year English, let's do it with you. Imagine that you're, you have reverted to the age of seven, all right? Your parents have told you that you can have a pet, which may be a cat or a dog or a pony, may be black, white, or brown, may be large or small or medium-sized. Imagine yourselves at the age of seven. What would you, no, money, no object, no problem about a stable or anything like that. Um, Money, no object. Which would you choose? So what you need to do is choose one item from each of those columns and just jot down which you would choose. Hmm. Now... Try and find someone sitting near you who chose exactly the same. Yeah, it's a lovely feeling, isn't it? Even even at our age, you know, it's even adults. It, it's nice to find someone else who chose chose the same as I did, um, and you've got lots of practice in the combination of the adjectives and nouns. In your languages, does the adjective come before the noun or after it? In your in your languages, before or after? Before. So it's the same as English. Okay. Um, a lot of languages have the adjective coming after, so, so this is a real problem for them. For your students, it would be less. But still, it gives them practice in vocabulary, and it is deeply personalized, because you're expressing your own preferences, uh, and they're genuine, authentic, personal preferences. At a higher level, um, for more advanced students, um, this is a nice one to do metaphors, and you can do it in all sorts of things. But this is a metaphor for an English lesson. Let's change your personalities and go back to being a teachers or teacher trainers, teacher educators. In your roles as teachers or teacher educators, which, in your opinion, is the best metaphor for an English lesson? Don't share for the moment. Just, just jot down or think. You don't even need to write it down, but choose one of them. When you have chosen just share with the person sitting next to you and the reasons why.
What did you choose? Anybody? Climbing. Conversation? Climbing. Consulting the doctor? Climbing a, Climbing a mountain? A symphony. A symphony. Symphony? Eating a mountain. Eating a mountain. Yeah, any of them are legitimate, but the interesting thing is why. Because it's a hectic in this class and I really have to climb. Right, the right. The climbing has a feeling of effort and achievement, <laughs> right? Um, and, and each of them has its own um, particular justification. Don't know if anybody choose what, chose what I, I choose, which is doing the shopping. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, but we may have chosen it for different reasons. I choose it because I plan my lesson like making a shopping list. Okay, I want to do this, 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 and this. And then afterwards I check and see if I've got through my, my, um, my aims. Anyway, um, what's interesting is that normally, if you do this in, a, in an advanced class, or it's, it's a nice teacher training um, exercise as well to get at how people conceptualize uh, the idea of a... Um, uh, of an English lesson. The interesting thing is that very, people very rarely choose the same one. So people sitting next to each other are unlikely to have chosen the same one. It's very interesting to hear how different people conceive or perceive the same reality. Um, even if they choose the same, they very often choose it for different reasons. So the discussion which comes out of this is really interesting for um, teacher trainees as well as the students. Collaboration. Learners work together in order to get better joint results than they could on their own. And there is, of course, the element of peer teaching here. Um, let's do this one. I think this is the last task I'm going to make you to do, make you do, so bear with me. Um, don't write these down. They are words which my students very often misspell. Right, yours as well? Words like because and people are really totally. Um, there are 10 words there. And the activity here, forget what I said about collaboration. We're going to do it as an individual um, task for the moment. I'm going to give you a few seconds to look at that screen. I'm then going to take it off the screen and ask you to write down as many as you can remember. So it's a kind of Kim's game, um, but on words, a memory game. So um, a few seconds to photograph that screen in your minds and try to remember. Don't get out your cell phones and start photographing it properly. And then See how many you can remember on your own without sharing. I can usually only remember about four or five of these. I'm very bad at it. Did you get five, four, five, three? <laughs> four. That's against. That's what. Wow. Okay, now, when you've got as many as you can, share with the people sitting next to you, behind you, in front of you, and see how many you've got there together. If you can get up to 10 together. You got up to 10? So share, get some more from people around you. Anybody got up to 10? With help, got up to 10? 9? 8? 8 is pretty good. 10, wow. Okay, here they are. What did you forget? I forgot. <laughs> Um, it's a very nice, first of all, it's very nice for spelling, it's nice for vocabulary, it's nice for irregular past tenses, things like that. Um, 
really helps them remember them, it's a good practice activity, but also it's very nice collaboration because inevitably, whatever the level of the of students, two students will always remember more than one, and three students will always remember more than two. So even for the most advanced, brilliant pupils, it is, it is worth their while to get together with others in order to collaborate um, and get a better result. And this is true of any exercise which has to do with recalling a set of items, as, as this one, or brainstorming. Because any task based on brainstorming, again, will get richer results with a larger group than with a smaller, and certainly more than with an individual. Um, so not all tasks work as collaborative activities. In my um, experience, pair work in principle, in general, works better than group work because the students, if, if there's only two of them, they have to work. Both of them have to work, whereas in group work, sometimes some students can opt out. It's also easier to control and, and organize. And make sure the task is such that it is likely to be better done by the group pair. And I gave some ideas about what types of tasks are better done by a group than by an individual. I'm not quite sure about this last one, whether in such situations you'd allow individuals to work on their own if they prefer. Sometimes students have come to me and said, I don't want to work with anyone else. I like working on my own there. It's their, their learning style. Um, and I don't think there's any rule about whether to allow that or not to allow that, depending on how well I know the student and what I think his, his or her motives are. Um, but it's, it's an open question there. The last two items I said were, I think, the most important. Open-ending means providing for lots of answers, in principle an infinite number of answers, to a single question, so that students can answer at their own levels. I'll give you an example here. More learners can get to respond in a larger class, and learners can respond at different levels. Closed-ended question. Can, can't, modal can, can't. Jenny is a baby, Jenny can, can't ride a bicycle. What's the right answer? Can't, there's one right answer. A student who is at this level can get a useful bit of practice from that. A student who is below this level and doesn't really know how to use can, can't, and doesn't know what a bicycle is, and doesn't know what ride is, can't do it or they'll guess it and possibly get it wrong. So they're not getting any very useful practice. A student who is well above this level knows all about babies and bicycles and can and can't, and can do it as easy as that. But they also are stuck with this silly sentence, and they cannot get practice of this grammatical point at a level that is appropriate for them. It's too easy for them. So both for my less advanced and my more advanced students, this is not appropriate. Supposing I change it and I say, Jenny is a baby, Jenny can't ride a bicycle, but she can smile. What else can or can't Jenny do? And I've given a model for my less advanced students, which they can copy. OK, give me some examples. She can cry. She can, cry. She can eat ice cream. She can eat ice cream. She can crawl. Very advanced student over here. You notice the word crawl? OK, so I've got advanced student saying she can crawl. She can see. Less advanced student over here. She can hear. Um, but I'm just joking aside. OK, you can see how students can answer at different levels, using different uh, vocabulary according to their own level, and all the students are activated. So that's open ending. Um, making it, and a lot of our... our uh, textbooks include closed-ended uh, exercises like this one, past tense. So they have to say, she left early, he made the cake, I sat there for six hours, the man read the book. And just as with Jenny, it's appropriate for the level, which is just about here, for students who are less advanced, the students who are more advanced, it is not appropriate. So I might just do it very quickly as it stands first, but then I might do something like this. She left. Can you give me a whole sentence with she left? 
she left early. That's why she heard the bell. Can you give me a whole sentence, please? It's very important for me for the students to say she left as well as it. She left as soon as the bell went. She left home. She left her husband. Okay. <laughs> yes. She left? Yesterday. yesterday. She left yesterday. Okay. Uh, also, and you can do it. And this is a really nice exercise because it gives them lots of practice contextualizing the past tense of leave in meaningful sentences, which they're inventing, as well as being... Um, I remember I said open ending was a, an aspect of interest, more interesting and definitely more heterogeneous. Here's another idea. She left, uh, let's take a different one. Um, uh, he, mm, the cake, made the cake, he, I want a whole sentence. He ate the cake, he baked the cake, he bought the cake, he threw the cake, he stole the cake, he burnt the cake. Okay, he dropped the cake. Okay, 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 I got the idea. But again, you've got opportunities for your less advanced students to have very simple, regular pasts, okay, and or ones that they happen to know, and the more advanced ones can use whatever they like. And you're getting, again, a lot of interesting appropriate practice in the past tense. Other possibilities, all sorts of brainstorming exercises. How many ways can you think of to use an empty tin can? It's a lovely one to do this, try it. <laughs> How many adjectives can you think of to describe the noun road? Okay, busy, broad, narrow, long, lots, lots of adjectives. How many nouns can you think of can be described by the adjective hard? So a hard piece of iron, a hard question, hard. Um, how many things can you think of to say about this picture? We did that. How many ways can you think of to solve this dilemma at a more advanced level? How many ways can you think of to compare a train with a car? How many endings can you think of for the sentence, if I had a million dollars? A slightly different heading all of those were how many different answers can you think of? This lateral thinking asks you, remember I spoke before about higher order thinking skills, makes you work a little bit harder in thinking of answers. But again, it's open-ended. There's no one right answer. So for example, instead of a train with a car, how many ways can you think of to, do, to compare a tree with a piece of spaghetti? <laughs> And you have, you can, your mind has to work hard. Okay, so for example, give me a sentence with using comparatives. A, a piece of spaghetti is thinner than a tree. A piece of spaghetti is smaller than a tree. Yes, okay, I want, I'm, I'm practicing comparative adjectives here. What is? A piece of spaghetti is soft if it's, if it's cooked, yes. <laughs> okay, and so on and so on. But, but we're thinking a bit harder here. Think of as many ways as you can in which a lesson is like a wedding. I brought this to a class once and they said, you're crazy, there's no way in which a lesson is like a wedding. By the time we'd finished the lesson, they had thought of 30 ways in which a lesson was like a wedding. It was quite amazing. Find six questions to which the answer is tomorrow. Of course, I don't know. Twelve. Okay. Very good way of practicing questions. Makes them think a bit. Um, and um, heterogeneous answers. Suggest so three advantages of things which are normally thought of as disadvantages. Name ten things you have never done instead of the normal things you have done. Name six things you can't touch. Six, say six negative things about whatever. And the last one I rather like, say four nice things about your friend using a negative. <laughs> she never quarrels with me. She never quarrels with me, okay? She never tells my secrets, she, and so on. You, could, you think about it, but, but you have to work higher order thinking skills trying to work out logical answers to questions. 
The final uh, thing I want to talk about the last few minutes is um, a principle called compulsory plus optional. What this means is, um, it could be activities and tests, it means that the class is, class is given a core task which is easily doable by everyone. It is the task where the success level is such that virtually all my class can do it. Okay, so it's easy. But then I add to that an optional task which is challenging for the more advanced or faster working students. Um, and I will usually hint to the ones I know who can do it that I expect them to go for the optional. Key words in the extractions, what you will see in this type of um, task is at least, do at least, such and such, and more if you can. Do X and do Y if you have time. So this, for example, at a very elementary level, practicing vocabulary, find at least three things to put in each column. If I just said, put all these words into the right columns, that would be homogeneous. It would not be a heterogeneous exercise, and some students would succeed and some students would fail. If I say find at least three, put at least three, then any student who's put three in there has already succeeded. The options are succeeding or succeeding even more. Okay, it's, so it's, it's, this is a, a typical heterogeneous exercise based on core plus optional. The same thing goes for tests. One of the problems with written tests is that the faster workers finish everything and then they have nothing to do. And um, the slower ones, the test is very often too difficult for them. They very often can't finish it. The solution that I'm suggesting is to have a test which, most of which can be done fairly easily by all of them, and which will get them 100% if they do it, plus an optional extra, which uh, can be done by the faster workers or the more advanced ones, or the ones who are particularly good at this, at the target piece of language is being tested, um, and which will earn them a bonus. This is controversial, okay, because it means that some of the students are going to get 120 or something. It doesn't worry me because I'm not too worried about assessment, but uh, this is something for the assessment people to sort out. But it does solve the problem of the heterogeneous class. It does mean that um, the less advanced students can succeed in tests and get a reasonable grade, while I am allowing more, uh, the more advanced ones, the faster workers, to fill in the time by doing the extra uh, piece of work. Um, and they also are doing a test that accords with their level um, and with the necessary challenge. So most of the test is compulsory, given a grade out of 100. A final se section is optional and gets bonus points. I don't know how acceptable this is in the kinds of schools you're working with where I work. I can get away with it. Um, here's an example. Um, a test mainly on past tenses and reading comprehension um, and a, in fact, it's not A, but the, the, the last compulsory section of the test um, has the students filling in past tenses in the story of Little Red Riding Hood. Um, the optional extra, which they don't have to do, but they can if they like, and it's quite inviting and challenging, although it's much more difficult, says, finish the story as you like, not the same way it usually finishes. So to finish off this session with a nice little story, this is a, a, a test I actually gave in, in one of my classes. Um, and um, one of the students took up the challenge of the last bit, and she wrote as follows. Uh, the wolf went off through the forest and came to the grandmother's house. He knocked on the grandmother's door, and the grandmother said, come in, and the wolf went in. And the grandmother said, oh, it's you, my dear little wolf. I'm so glad. I thought it was that awful little red riding hood. <laughs> <laughs> so that's a bonus for the teacher. <laughs> Thank you.
if anyone wants these, as I said, they will be on the British Council site. If not, here's my email. Please feel free to email me and I'll send you the slides.